All right, uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is JP, I'm the founder and uh, chief security officer at Security. Uh, I'm gonna uh, pass it down the line for everyone to give a brief 10 to 30 second introduction to themselves, and then we'll jump into things. My name is Adam Vincent, I am the CEO and a co-founder of a company called Threat Connect. I'm Kim Watson, I'm the tech director of IACD here at APL. Um, Bruce Potter, uh, the CISO at Expel, um, and also my wife and I run uh, ShmooCon down in DC each year. Uh, all right, so uh, the top of this panel is really to explore the evolution and the future of security automation. Uh, so we're going to do that, but we're going to start out kind of with uh, what, what I would call kind of the forgotten evolution. So one of the things I've noticed uh, as a larger sampling of SOAR deployments are out there to see how, it's, see how they're succeeding, I've noticed a couple things. Uh, the first one is that you can't start with SOAR. SOAR assumes that you have good data in. So that means a, a tuned SIM. That means, uh, or, but how do you get there? And so I, I talked to a lot of people about this problem, and, and you know, my overarching kind of uh, process that I think needs to happen is um, you need to kind of start with your crown jewels. So as a business or a, you know, an agency, you need to actually assess your crown jewels, figure out what they are, and then once you understand what they are, um, be, be that architecture drawings or you know, a database with natural secrets, um, you need to figure out what the misuse cases are against them. Um, once you've done that, you're now enabled to figure out what the telemetry is that you need to know when, you, uh, you know, when there's malicious activity against those systems. Um, and then, only then can we actually start to, to figure out what are the, the workflows that we might want to build that then we may want to automate. So um, in the absence of this process, I see what I'd call um, the manifestation of really good, sale, really good, maybe pervasive sales and marketing programs, leaving an incoming CISO with a random security stack that doesn't really address uh, the needs of the organization as it regards to protecting their crown jewels. Um, and this comes with a hefty spend to fix this. And, and maybe it already has a hefty spend just to maintain their existing stack. So um, the CISO's challenge with needing to refactor this in order to move the puck forward in order to adopt tools like SOAR or products like SOAR. So I, you know, I'm just gonna throw that one at the panel and we're gonna go down the line and just see, you know, do people agree with me with that assessment? Is this, you know, is this a roadblock in SOAR adoption? Um, and maybe what are some of the things that uh, the, the SOAR community should be doing to you know, tell the story around what are the things you need to do to be prepared to adopt SOAR? That was a, a lot, JP. I know. <laughs> let, me, let me start with um, having an architecture would be a, a nice uh, first step, and then having an architecture on the business side uh, which most organizations do have, um, doesn't necessarily mean that the security organization has an architecture and understands what their requirements are and has processes on um, how they're managing security today. And so SOAR is a technology solution to speed up and, and, and make the process of managing security more efficient. But until you know what your processes are based on the business processes that you need to support, it's kind of a, um, a technology solution without an understanding of the problem. And so with that said, I think there are um, people that are enamored with the thought of, I'm going to buy a technology, is going to bring with it an understanding of process. And to some extent, it will, because it's gonna come out of the box with certain use cases being met. But the reality is those use cases may not be aligned with your organization and the problems that you have. So I'll come at this a little different. So the answer is yes. Um, as we pilot, as we work with people, there are absolutely realities that come into play if you're gonna try to bring automation and orchestration. I'm gonna offer a couple of practical opportunities. So the first thing is I tell the CISOs when somebody's there to sell you something, the first question you ask them is not how is this going to help me? or what is this going to do? The very first question you should ask is, how does this make everything else I already have better, and what does it break? And so that's the first part about trying to minimize that stack and remove security products that you don't need or products that are duplicative or have their own isolated ecosystem. So we always tell them the other question you should talk to is, and it's related to the API. That's how does it make it better and what does it break is directly proportional to how well can it integrate and be available. The other place is we've been talking to people that the, the use of SOAR shouldn't be create the best process. 
or you know, take the process your analysts are doing and implement it correctly. It needs to be about triage and prioritization and basically offloading as fast as possible things you should not have people working on. Use automation to do that. So there is information, so I always go to the identify part of the framework where it says have an inventory of this and of that and a, you know, and nobody does it. Now, if there's a piece of information that would allow you to take an alert and throw it away immediately because it's appropriate, acceptable, or false positive, then spend the time getting that information and you will maintain it because it is operationally relevant. So we offer to use automation and orchestration and figuring out these pieces of information that would allow you to triage and prioritize faster and spend the time getting those and get those in order. And at that point, I think I'll stop and let Bruce go. Sure. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges with, with SOAR is that it's like a third order thing that you implement, right? Like you've instrumented your enterprise, you've got some endpoint technologies and network technologies and other things, and then you aggregate it and then you automate it. Um, one of the challenges I've seen is that people have made a bad decision in the beginning um, about the way that their business works or their security requirements or whatever, and then that just precipitates all the way through. And so if you made a bad decision early about the things that you care about, and to JP's point, like what the crown jewels are, what you hold near and dear to your business or your organization, by the time you've automated it, you've automated a bad thing, right? Or at least a not useful thing, right? I've, I've seen analysts spend a lot of time digging through data that was all inconsequential, but it's just, man, there's all this data and we gotta dig through it, let's automate that. Like, no, let's actually throw it away. Um, and and I, I've been shocked over the years of the number of organizations that I've worked with who could not articulate what they did, right? Um, so as an example, I did work with a, a wireless company once upon a time, and we, we have a, it's a security assessment, we do this kickoff, and uh, um, you know, a bunch of people come in and I say, well, what does your company do? And I get a lot of diagrams of various services and parts and pieces. And so then um, we went back and we rallied, and the next day I came in with an architecture, and I put it on the wall, I said, this is what your company does. And they said, wow, that's amazing, we didn't realize what we did. <laughs> holy crap, it was like a thousand person organization. There was no one that could articulate that thing that they did. Um, and so when we stepped back and looked at the security controls and instrumentation they put in place and then their, the, the aggregation and automation activities after that, they were doing a lot of stuff that just didn't matter, right? So I think taking a step back to the beginning, um, you know, even before like what signal am I generating, but like what does it actually do and I care about is, is the first step to a successful SOAR deployment. Yeah, and you know, one of the things I was, uh, I, had, I had a dinner with Bruce last night and we were talking about, um, I can't tell you how many SIM deployments I've seen where they, d they take the out of the box set of correlation rules and like that's where they start, those are their alerts. But I'm a believer that when you get an alert, you just wrote a check to the, you know, the business just wrote a check because it needs to be dealt with. And so I, I believe that in order to have, a, you know, an alert come into a store product to take action on, there needs to be a business case behind that. You don't just create alerts for your health, but you create them because, you know, back to the whole crown jewel argument, because they're actually telling you that there's something happening with something we care about. All right, that was a great kind of way to kick things off. So let's see. So um, I want to talk a little bit about knowledge management. So um, I would characterize uh, you know, we're kind of moving from SOAR 1.0, which is, you know, kind of like this eyes off triage um, approach to a more full stack or a more, you know, fully holistic solution. And, uh, and um, it's obvious that, it's becoming obvious to me at least, that institutional knowledge is critical to the ongoing operations of a security team. Uh, it affects everything from onboarding new analysts, building out playbooks, and ensuring smooth transitions when analysts move on to different roles or companies. Um, so, so I, I at least have two questions for, for the panel. Um, so the first question is, do you guys agree that knowledge management is an overlooked component to the SOAR family of use cases? So it is, and it's overlooked in a couple of places. So there's not just the knowledge management of why things are what they are and why you've built the workflows you've built and, and why you're doing what you're doing it's also lost in the business operations piece. So what hasn't come into the SOC is exactly what Bruce was talking about. So if there's a, a way to capture 
the business objective that you're trying to make happen and that SOAR is just a piece of ensuring the health of, right? That's its purpose, is speed and scale to sort of maintain objectives. So there needs to be this, this way of understanding why they do what they do and why this is the, the acceptable piece. Because if you don't, all you're gonna get is change management and configuration management and some sustainability on workflows, which is great. But at some point they become completely out of date with the business model. And so while I think we're getting to the point where people are starting to capture, when we first started this, they didn't do versioning on workflows, a lot of the orchestrators. And then people were rolling their own, and what businesses were finding is people were rolling their own conflicting workflows, and right, they were having their own race conditions inside their own environment. And so they've, they've done it with respect to that aspect and the roles of the organization and capturing, and they'll allow you to tie um, signatures deployed and actions to certain things, but what they're missing is the bigger why. And that knowledge management, I think, is actually more critical because that allows you to throw things away. It allows you to do, and we talk a lot about low regret, don't worry about being right. If it's not particularly gonna have a high impact, do it. And, and don't wait till you're sure, do it sooner. And you cannot do that without a business understanding. So I think that's the knowledge management that is not captured in the SOC that really needs to be. Yeah, so, so I absolutely agree with that. I, I wanna point to Bruce who, you know, expels an MSSP. And, uh, you know, I think all those problems exist, you know, in, in an entity. But when you're an MSSP, that has to wrangle 200 entities, right? The ability for the analyst to essentially switch context mm -hmm. between not only different, you know, technical environments, but different business, business you know, business um, environments. Like, like, you know, I, you're shaking your head, yeah, so I'm assuming you agree that this is a problem. So, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how Excel has solved that or how they're thinking of this problem? Sure, um, I think in, it's not surprising that knowledge management is somewhat a forgotten part of this because knowledge management is a forgotten part of like every business function, um, right? Like you just do it and then you wonder why you did it and six months later uh, and we're really good at running businesses that way. Uh, and, and for security decisions and risk decisions, uh, it becomes untenable because you're not only doing the same work but you're putting your organization um, at potentially material risk. So, um, you know, KM is, is a hard problem. I think um, the way that we think about it is that, it, um, I mean, and this is common across a lot of domains, knowledge management has to be like part of the, the, the path of least resistance, right? Like it can't be a separate fork where like you do a bunch of work and then you go off to the side and you document it, right? Because like nobody goes back and writes the documentation. So, um, you know, just like when you're developing code, if your developers aren't forced to comment their code and have good metadata, they're never gonna go back in time and put that genie back in the bottle. Um, so like our, our view is like make it as, as, as much a part of the analyst workflow as possible. So as they're learning context, as they're gaining understanding of different businesses, different customer environments, um, part of their uh, workflow natively captures that information. It's super low friction, it's super easy, um, and let the machines kind of do the detailed processing. As long as the analyst can get the basics in there, then we'll figure it out from there. So um, you know, that's our philosophy, but again, it's like that's generally the philosophy of successful knowledge management is don't make it painful, make it part of the path, and you'll probably get decent results. So I would add, um, I think these are really good answers. The, the one thing is that I think knowledge management is a component of a larger uh, discipline known, of, uh, known as information management. And information management tends to include a bunch of other facets of the way we collect data and turn it into the raw materials for decision making, as is knowledge. The one thing I, I could add to what these guys said is knowledge isn't going to just be in our organization. It's going to be across our community and finding ways to share the tradecraft of a process, finding ways to share um, the TTPs of an adversary, um, all of those types of um, data uh, management principles are going to become the raw materials for us as a community to improve. Awesome. So you kind of answered the question I was just about to ask, which is, you know, how do you see the maturation of, um, you know, socks and, and people using storage technologies um, better enabling the SOC, right? So, so that's kind of a great answer to that yeah. question. Um, you know, is the, do, we, do you think the application of knowledge management is better suited for automation? Is it better suited just for the analysts to kind of have the right mental context when they're dealing with things? Or, or can we kind of plug the, 
inputs from knowledge management into automation, and, and um, or or is the knowledge management really just going to be used for the human part of of the you know the alert handling and the incident response? So I, I mean I think good automation is is codification of knowledge, right? I mean that's really what it's all about. Is you, we know a thing, we know how to do a thing, we know a process, and we're codifying it in such a way that allows the robots to do it, so the humans don't have to. Um, and so if if you view automation and the source space in general as the ultimate manifestation of taking knowledge and, and making it become something that's more autonomous and automatic and, and computer driven, um, then you have to think about KM as a pipeline that gets you from an idea in someone's head to the computers actually doing the work. So it's not that there's a confluence page or I've got a bunch of data shoved into a database somewhere. It's that I then have a continuation of the pipeline that is able to extract that data and punch it out and make workflows out of it, make run books, whatever it is that I need to do in my model, I'm, I'm able to, to go through that. And it may start with like just a, high, a bunch of Random facts, right? Like it does, that's not like a day one kind of thing, but you know, over time, as you collect more information about how your organization or your customers or whatever work, ultimately your goal is to make the computers do that and get that knowledge captured and codified. And then the, 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 the tricky part is then it's not static, right? Like once that stuff's captured, it can change. Um, we have plenty of customers that as they mature or deploy new tech, like we have to change all kinds of pieces and parts of their, 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 the automation platform that we have to adapt to their environment. So um, you also then need a, need a lever that allows you to recognize and adapt over time. You guys want to add to that? You don't have to, but. I think I would just, um, I, I think you said this, but, but just say it again, like the, the goal of a system of record is to, um, provide knowledge, provide data to the organization across disciplines that make sense to be um, the, the raw materials for decision making. The purpose in a system of engagement is the layer on top of a system of record that humans use to do their job more effectively with that data. And the system of engagement is a data producer in itself. And that data actually can be more valuable um, because they're, they're always um, improving the data set, and then that data set is then improving the next process. So I'd like to come at this a little different um, based on evolution and where we're going. So where we see in IACD some missing pieces that industry is not dealing with while they're throwing AI, ML, knowledge engineering, and all of deep learning all at the space, right? Yeah. And, <laughs> and the point is it's the ecosystem. They're creating their own closed loops because the data drives with how valid they are, in which case they don't want it to be at somebody else's expense. And if, if we're really going to evolve, orchestration is not going to be hand-coded if then else loops are going to be way too complex because you're going to be bringing in knowledge as you have it. And, and the idea that the processes capture the, the, the knowledge and the capabilities and the context that is necessary for the the evolution of the thing is we're going to get to this place where there is a distributed distributed set of sense making and, and decision making sources and sensing sources that all have to come together asynchronously depending right you may program them to to capture and do and and that's going to have to be necessary to improve the the processing as we go and so it's going to be much more of a i hate Crowd to stock. say like a policy or overlay Right, but what the people are going to have to encode once and only once, and not in every single tool and every single knowledge loop and every single algorithm, their their accepted uh, risks and their unaccepted risks. It's going to be built over time, and going to have to come into play. So I think this idea of thinking about the ecosystem is needing to handle touch points for these autonomy constructs, systems that are being put out there, so that the knowledge capture is part of just another one of these running cycles that feeds the other, so that there is the ability to integrate at the information to knowledge space as opposed to the data space that we're currently living in. And it's going to have to evolve to there where these systems, there's just going to be a bunch of autonomy systems running, they're all going to be independent, they'll all do different things, and they will be just as as screwed up as our 700 security tools are that you've deployed in your network. So, so how many years do you think we're away from like the commercial application of that thought? Uh, I, th I think we're much closer because I think from a practical application standpoint, you could start thinking of some of the, 
the ways in which people are using tools, you could use them differently to collect some of this, right? You could build your workflows differently. And you could be thinking about the knowledge differently and you could be bringing things back and forth. Now, are they fully autonomous? Of course not. But you could start changing the construct of orchestration and workflow to be more about this management construct in an ecosystem that can work together and you can create some touch points. I think because the big vendors have gone to these fabrics, it's going to happen much sooner than if they were still keeping their vertical stacks. I agree with that. Um, like, this is a good conversation. Like, uh, you know, I have my next topic, but I feel like there's a few other things to pull here. Anybody want to? I think the blue pill. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, say something maybe inflammatory is that the, the concept of, of um, connecting computer systems is not new. Um, the idea of moving data around an enterprise is also not new. The, the, the problems we're solving in security today are not new. They're problems that the business has faced for a very long time. They've integrated different products. They've moved data around. They've made better decisions with that data. I think we could spend a lot more time looking at what the business has done and looking at the concepts that you just said, which is, a, I think, a great vision for us, but I don't think we need a standard necessarily. We need to start solving problems, and I think if we look at uh, where we came from, the IT world, we could um, advance the state of the art here. Yeah, I mean, if you think about the history of IT, right, like, it, it's, I mean, it's just 10 years more advanced than where we are right now, right? They had, used to have data centers full of stuff and individual systems, and you were struggling with enterprise management and manager of managers, you know, people getting Tivoli and HPOV and all these other things and jamming them together in a room and writing all kinds of spaghetti code just trying to keep things alive, but it was better than the alternative, which was hire a universe of sysadmins to go rack stack, plug, and take care of your systems in some bespoke fashion. But that largely all got Got solved through a you know a better management and 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 uh, kind of operational uh, processes, but also like, just changes in architecture, right? Like we went from bare metal and big racks to virtualized to containers, and it made a lot of that go away. So um, you know the, it's a dynamic space, and and I think security is in that same way where we're kind of a little bit like IT management was maybe 15 years ago where there's products, there's stuff, but you still require really smart people to move them together and try to make sense of it all. Um, but maybe in 10 or 15 years, you know, the products will have, have evolved far enough and, and the way that we operate and secure our enterprises will evolve far enough that it's commodity. Um, I mean, that's the goal, right? Like, we don't want to have to hire so many smart people uh, to do this. Like, it'd be cool to have to have less smart people to do this. Not from an economic perspective. I'm sure this is a big driver for most of us in paying the bills, but um, from a <laughs> practical perspective for securing our enterprises. All right, so um, I I'm gonna kind of switch gears a little bit and uh, talking about applying risk-based decision models to uh, orchestration. So. Um, you know, and when I think about risk-based decision model, this could be anything from, you know, some, you know, big fours, you know, spreadsheet that gives you magic numbers to something like, you know, the attack framework, um, or just any way of scoring or framing risk. And so, um, what's the utility, I guess I kind of have three questions around this. So, for the first one is, what's the utility of these models as an input to understand the ROI of implementing different technologies um, as um, things that can be used by SOAR? So, the example would be, um, you know, if, I, if I'm a CISO and I say, hey, I can implement two-factor for 50K a year and reduce 95% of my malicious logins, like, that to me sounds really easy to justify, not only to the security organization, but to the business. Um, so, so I'll start with that one just as an example of like, ways that we can um, look at what we can currently do today with SOAR and, and apply those models to think of, well, where, where should we deploy, like, where should our early wins be with SOAR to show our ROI to the business? Because one of the I say still sticky points with SOAR is kind of like the automated remediation where like people don't trust the systems yet. Like it's not necessarily proven that this can just happen. So how can we take, you kind of touched on this a few minutes ago or maybe prior to the panel, but um, it sounds like you all want to talk. So I'll just stop. I like to talk about what process the customer is doing right now that's painful and uh, show improvement. And then once we fix that one, work on the next one and the next one, However, I don't think that's the right way for us as an industry to work. But I it think sells software. It, it does, and it also <laughs> demonstrates value. And yeah. I think 
you know, rather than say it the way you said it, I'd rather prefer to solve problems. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I do think that we as an industry aren't spending enough time thinking about the strategic architecture of our organization and, and looking um, from the top down of portfolio management, why do we buy this product, and how are we quantifying its um, value to the organization, what, is, what are is its objectives, and are we measuring those, um, those products to make sure we are meeting them. Um, we're, we spend a lot of time at the tools level, mm -hmm. and um, because of that, we end up um, enamored by all of the, <coughs> I would say, smaller problems. Now, SOAR, actually, as a technology, even though maybe it's not the perfect place to start solving problems, you need to look at it strategically, the one thing that it does very quickly is it starts to demonstrate where you have an issue, and then you can take that to the next level and make it into a more strategic conversation. Yeah, and, and before you pass the mic, um, I feel like SOAR is in a unique space to um, potentially, I don't know if I ever actually see people doing this, but like to evaluate the efficacy of security tools in some case. Mm -hmm. and, and, but you know, there's an inherent conflicts there for, you know, more market reasons than you know, ethical reasons, but. So we've actually offered, with some of the pilots, we tried to do this, where basically the first check was, is it already whitelisted or blacklisted? So you get a threat feed, and this is just IOCs, and, and granted they have their value, but if you can't handle them fast, it's not worth handling them, mm -hmm. right? You either do it quickly or don't do it at all, because the window of the value is, is very tactical. So you can actually use it to figure out how other things you've bought work and, and help to determine uniqueness or value of a feed, which is one thing. It also helps you understand how often certain tools were used to make a decision or um, and used based on the decisions you could make. And we've also used to figure out the inherent threat information in a lot of these security products and compare to them and figure out. And we've, we've gotten some of those vendors to open up visibility so you can understand were they already taking care of this in their product on your behalf, and if so, then you don't need. So we've gotten to a little bit about using it to evaluate eff efficacy. Right. Because the last thing you want as a, as a SOC manager is another alert, right? Yeah. Because there's too many cases where, you know, you go to RSA and you look at the show floor and 98% of the people are selling you another alert. Yeah. And like, I have enough alerts already. I need to get to the bottom of my haystack before I can even consider that. But a lot of times when I write this check for this new alert that I have to go deal with, it's not as clear to me, like, why did, was, this, was this some grandma searching Napster, or was it actually a nation state actor trying to do something crazy? Right. And, it's hard, and, and with that context that like, you know, threat and tell vendors are trying to provide, like, that helps me make better decisions as a business, right? Well, it can help you prioritize. I happen prioritize, to think, yes. I happen to think the, they were going way too far with some of the threat to drive defenses. I think most of the threat feeds, and no offense to Threat Connect, who I've talked to a lot, um, they're meant to feed threat intelligence that are meant to prioritize in a textual way certain things. And all I want is something that is actionable by net defenders because maybe I don't give a damn who. Mm -hmm. right? yeah, I don't care about Napster. So I, I don't care, care about who. someone trying to steal my data. Well, and I, great. And if they're there and I can at scale, and if my def defenses are more at scale, then it can handle everybody regardless of who. Yeah. Right? Um, the thing I was going to say is about the response. So everybody, the, the first order win on SOAR that you can market is the analyst time saved and its investigative processes because those are harmless and you do all the cut and paste and it helps keep your analysts happily. So everyone kept telling me and we actually had somebody associated with the White House say, but nobody takes automated response. So I made an entire briefing that said, first off, let me tell you, every person in this room is having automated response happen. You're letting your vendors do it. You just don't let your SOC teams do it. Your vendors are doing it. You may or may not know you've clicked those buttons. And you may do it for very valid reasons of liability, a perception that the vendor knows better or their business case is hurt more by being wrong. And so there's a, we, we had this matrix of sort of regret benefit. That high benefit, low regret is what you let your vendors do. And like I'm that. all good yeah. with that, right? Let your vendors do that. If you, but the, that next bottom one of potentially you know, low benefit, so it's the adware, it's the, the crap that keeps your your white noise too high. Find out how to, you know, what your policy is around that and start wiping that stuff out too and don't worry about being so right and start getting comfortable with responses because then you start getting your teams to work together and you start figuring out how to tie these and you get a lot more of the IT asset management employed in the SOC process and I'll stop there. Well, and that's, I mean, that's a, 
a rough space, right? Like, cause at least when your vendors are doing that, that um, automated response in, in more of an IT context, like that's their thing, they own it, right? Yeah. They know it. Um, you know, when you're it's a security vendor, like they're just divining, like how does this thing work? What do we think it's supposed to do? So when you let them make the changes, you are putting yourself, I think, at, at greater risk right now because they're they're a third party to the process, right? Like all of these security providers are third parties to the oh, process. Oh, third parties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> There's a rat hole that knows those bounds. Yeah. But um, I, I will say, when it comes to um, kind of to get back to your original question, um, uh, one of the things that we do is we look at every element technology that we integrate in. Um, and, and look at the number of alerts that it generates and then ultimately uh, what we do with it. So how many of those alerts uh, did we have to look at? How many of those alerts did we actually have to investigate? And how many of those alerts actually resulted in incidents? Um, and then further, some technologies, while maybe not great or even geared toward the detection, are great for the response. So then we look at how often did we pivot and use those technologies for different response and remediation actions. And so over time, you build a picture of like, this thing's super useful, and if I make made some configuration tweaks to be even more useful, and this thing over here is a doorstop, and I'm paying $5 million a year for it, we should throw that doorstop away. Um, and, and you know that has real impact on bottom line when you can start to look at, hey, there, there are whole parts of our infrastructure that, that we are not getting value out of. But I, you know, I, I think from, from, a, from a SOAR perspective, and, and, and to get to the risk issue, like, so I'm a NIST CSF weenie. Uh, which is a great social media bio if you don't want anybody to reach out to you on social media. Um, <laughs> Just trying to wake everybody up a little bit. It's noon, you know. Get it going. Um, so, um, if it, one of the things that, that that I've done is look at the impact of uh, SOAR and various technologies on different subcategories within CSF. So you've got identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Um, most of these technologies don't in the tactical sense have any impact on identify and protect. Over time, you may get insight into your organization that allows you to buoy up some of those sub subcategories because you're seeing things better and you can make kind of left of boom impact, uh, if you will. Um, but where you really see the impact is in detect, primarily, unsurprisingly, and then less so in recover, and then, uh, uh, or excuse me, um, in, in response, and then even less so in recover, right? Because recovery is that that automated going in, flipping all the switches, making things better. Like we're a long way from letting the robots make our organization better. We're barely letting our, our robots remediate for us. Um, so when, if, if you were to tear apart the CSF um, and, and look at detect, that's where right now all the impact is, right? And there are some subcategories that you get um, immediate material response regardless of how you're tooled. There are other ones that you get a, a good response if you have other things that are in place. So we've liked, um, you know, for instance, there's a number of them that talk about like, um, basically, are you detecting all malicious mobile code or whatever, that kind of thing. Well, you obviously have to have like mobile code detection capability in place in your endpoints and it has to come back to a central place. So there's like dependencies that live outside of that subcategory. Um, but for the most part, most, to get to the, back to the original conversation, if you have reasonable signal being generated, and you have SOAR technology in place, you're going to mitigate risks in very specific areas. You can know that before you even deploy, right? Um, if you go to um, our website, this, I'm not selling you anything, but I've written a paper on like what the NIST CSF, um, if you use that as your backstop and you're looking at MSSP or SOAR technology, where those immediate gains are. Um, so there's actually concrete data that you can go look at, um, and I'm happy to chat about that. Not here, you know, if you can ping me, I'm happy to jam. Yeah, and so for me, there's kind of two types of things that identify risk. There's like your security tooling, but then there's also humans, right? And so as a, you know, as a practitioner and, and sword vendor, I'm looking for low-hanging fruit that can, you know, m remove more risk without as, you know, without as much risk to the business. So like an example of that would be, you know, uh, like the user submitted fish and the phishing, you know, the phishing use case is big and sore, right? And so, you know, kind of something that we've done is, is we're, we're taking user submitted fishes and saying, hey, well, we had a human that actually decided that this might smell funny, right? And so instead of waiting for it to go through like, you know, the trust but verify phase of, of containment, we're gonna contain it when it comes in and we're gonna release that from containment or from quarantine if we turn out that it really just is the CEO's hunting newsletter because that mitigates risk, but also potentially removes the cost of me having to clean up 50 machines, like instantly, right? So, so like, we, you know, humans cannot get to, to it as fast as the machine could, could potentially, you know, block that link, right? And so, like, that's a huge win, you know, just by thinking, you know, in a crafty way. I think email is a good example, too, because um, generally the attacker is going to send the email to multiple people simultaneously. 
And, and when it was a manual process to review a submitted email, that meant there was time, um, human time involved. In this scenario, if you can automatically convict one of those emails as it's submitted to the security uh, process, um, it then can automatically convict all the rest of the emails and remove mm -hmm. them from an inbox before any users click on them. Um, we even see some interesting things happening with SOAR where the um, SOAR is actually automatically going out to the employee and ha in uh, submitting them for additional phishing training when they yeah, submit yeah. a certain number like of emails that are, are yeah. that are not uh, actually malicious. The one thing I would add um, to kind of the conversation we've been having about efficacy and measuring efficacy is that with SOAR, I think we're going to have a, a new opportunity to measure efficacy across our broader uh, security team. And when I say team, I don't just mean the people that sit in our SOC. Um, phishing email is a great example. Many companies are starting to outsource some of the analytic tr uh, process to uh, MSSPs. They're, they're taking parts of their mitigation and, and response, and they have companies that are doing that for them that sit in their, in their business, but they're not actually employees. So that, that race to the bottom line, making parts of security a commodity, is going to require this end-to-end -end visibility that the CISO is going to need in order to operate that part of their business more effectively. Yeah, so, so, so just real quick. We got quick. about eight, eight minutes left, and I have to, oh. to tackle the elephant. OK, but, I'll uh, let you do that. That's fine. Go ahead. We you just, got, we we got 30 seconds. Time. No, 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 I'm good. Yeah, I know. I'm good. All Kill right, the elephant. So, so um, you know, <laughs> this is going to go bad. Um, <laughs> all right, so um, I, I don't, I'm not convinced either way yet, but you know, I want to know. Yeah, I'm going to um, <laughs> start with you. So. so I, you know, I've seen a few interesting presentations this weekend around, or this week around, you know, machine learning, and um, I'm still not convinced that you know we have the the sample sizes um, to really to really do ML or to really apply ML to SOAR use cases. I, I do think you know we can apply math to it, we can apply statistics to it, and make better decisions. Um, but I'm not over the line on ML, so you know. Why don't you kind of share with me? You probably talk to more people than, than we do on a daily basis, but where is it right now? Where is it going? Is, there, is this a real opportunity to reduce risk, to move, to move the industry forward? Is it smoke and mirrors? So I think that we'll actually get to a point where we can do some of the other things we've talked about before. Those other things will show true um, true fruition. And, and my rationale for this is partly what you talked about. There's not enough data. But I'll also tell you they're, they're using a lot of the research in this space is implied in areas that don't have certain realities that we have. So if you think about, you know, you'll see a lot of comparisons to autonomous vehicles. I mean, physics doesn't change real quickly. Mm -hmm. The models of physics don't change real quickly. How a person steps off a curb doesn't change. Now, they may do it in the middle of the road versus a crosswalk, yeah, but in general, but it's still 9.81. It, it doesn't right. change a lot. So once you get to where you trust the automation, you sort of stay in that mode. Mm -hmm. And they don't have the idea of going backwards. In cyber, if machine learning, your models are going to change because the adversary will change. You may change your environment and your business. And more importantly, an election happens. The Olympics happen. You know, there is an event. And so you need to understand when did things change enough that I have to bring the wheel back, right? When do I come back to the wheel? When do I do? And that kind of mindset that says cyber is a different beast and you have to think about the research and the modeling differently is missing. And so even when you get great examples, I believe you will get very quickly, and there are some self-contained OODA loops using machine learning or... Math, I'll just call it mathematical t techniques that are good for automated sense making and automated decision making support. And so in like, very small cases, automated decision making because your choices are A, B. But, but to me, those decisions are prioritization based. They're not like we're going to throw a model at something and then automatically cut people off the network. Right? Well, they're they're more of like force multipliers for the analyst and not necessarily. I'm seeing some of the other. Okay. What, what it is, is you're going to have to have comfort and trust in deciding to implement it. And right now, I'm not even willing to block malware. Yeah. Right. right. Am I going to cut somebody off the network? So, right. so there's a trust piece that's missing. Bruce. So, um, I mean, the worst thing that automated systems can do is make a bad decision, right, um, and act on it. 
right? They can make bad decisions in a vacuum and contemplate their navel, and that's totally okay. But the minute they act <laughs> on it, we're like, shut it down, right? Like I worked in a bunch of enterprises that had IDS that was okay, and nobody thought it sucked. And then they turned it into an IPS, and they put it in the dumpster, right? They're like, wow, that shut down the enterprise. <laughs> Throw it in the trash. So. Um, uh, the, the problem I had, it, it, I mean, it's exactly what you said. Like, this is a super dynamic area. By the time that you, you've, you've trained your system, you've got your classifier doing the thing it's supposed to do and all this kind of stuff, you deploy it, and then something happens in the industry, something happens in your network two days later, and the whole thing's scrambled, and you got to go back to supervised learning, and humans have to sit there and do a bunch of work and whatever. You, you're going to be like, why the hell are we doing this again? Um, I just can't wrap my head around that the state of the art of ML has come to the point where I am anywhere near willing to let it do anything for me. If it wants to inform me, like make the analysts smarter and help them make decisions, I mean, the analyst is the final arbiter of like, you know, idiotic things, and they can decide, like, that's stupid. And I'm going to ignore it. Um, the same way, like I've done a lot of aviation security work, and when you talk about like what happens when something weird comes to the pilot, well, the pilot's the final arbiter of the plane, and they make good decisions because they want to stay alive, right? <laughs> An analyst wants to make good decisions because they want to keep their job. So if the ML gives them something stupid, no harm, just some lost, you know, electrons. But if it does something stupid, then it's a whole different problem. You gotta go. All right. Well, <laughs> so. so um, I, I, we have two minutes left, so I, I'll, I'll give a, a closing thought and let you respond to that. So I spent about an hour and a half uh, on Tuesday this week with a guy that works for Google AI, and his job is to basically, he's an ML engineer, and his job is to go in and look at data sets and try to understand what businesses, uh, w where the potential use cases are in these data sets. And, you know, uh, he, he gave me some great ideas, and, like, he thinks there's an opportunity. He's not sure that it's, you know, uh, you know we're going to actually go make final decisions with that. But what my big takeaway, which I think was positive for me, was if I, as a business, invest in exploring machine learning use cases with my data, so for example, my SOAR data, that the worst thing that's going to happen is I'm going to have a better understanding of my data and how I could maybe use it better. So I'm going to close with that final thought, and maybe we can go down the line and you know, wrap up. Yeah, I, I definitely think that SOAR is a great opportunity to leverage data to make better decisions. And I do think analytics is going to be key to that because we, we just don't have enough people to do it all manually. I just think the decisions are going to be too complex. They're going to be too attribute-based and dynamic. So automated decision support is where we really want to focus because we think that's more likely to happen. Yeah, and, and the way I would call that in is like, to me, I want to get context where I wouldn't think of getting context, right? And, and, you know, that's almost like, that's not really operationalizing the analyst thinking, but like, you know, there's times where you might spend a week on an investigation, you, you find out that like this nugget at the end, and how can you put those nuggets in front of the analyst sooner, right? Based on codifying that thought process so that you can bubble things up at the end. And that's not ML, that's just like, you know, taking your process and getting it to work better, right? And using technology to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think at, at the end of this, where, I mean, the store is ultimately successful, it's that we have assurance that it's doing the right thing at the tail end, that the do is correct. Um, and, and I think we've made huge strides in that uh, uh, department in the last 10 years, plus or minus. I mean, this event used to be around like SCAP and other automated protocols and things of that nature, and we've kind of accepted like we can all exchange data now, so we've learned to walk a little bit, which is cool, and now we're talking about like maybe we'll let the robots go a little farther and see what happens. Um, and, and so I, 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 I see good things happening. doesn't mean it's not frustrating. doesn't mean we're not going to hurt ourselves in the process, but um, I, at the end of it, uh, I think it's going to be a lot of good engineering and a lot of good work and not magic box technology like the third coming of AI or some nonsense like that. Um, does, does anybody in the audience want to, you know, no one's kicking me off the stage, so does anybody in the audience want to uh, ask the panel any questions? Are we on 15 minutes, actually? Oh, I thought we went until 12. No, we go until 12.15, so there are 15 more minutes, oh, and then everybody's the going to The fear of not filling up the hour. <laughs> so I wasn't paying attention. We're just going to riff for 15 minutes. <laughs> um, and then remember to stay here because people will be coming in. Right. Um, Okay, I got a question for you. Um, so, um, given the topic, evolution of cybersecurity automation, um, and the future of that, so assume that we make great strides in security automation, and uh, this, this is really being very uh, effective and stuff like that. 
Where is the attack surface going to be in the future? Uh, how is this going to push, where is this going to push the attack surface or the attack vectors um, for, the, for our bad guys? Because we know they're not going to stop, right? So what should we be looking towards in the future, per se? Where are we pushing them? That's my I, question. I think ultimately we're re reducing the low-hanging fruit and forcing them to climb further up the tree. Um, the, the act of moving away from um, spreadsheets and lots of manual processes uh, gets rid of a um, glaring hole in our security, which is called human speed. Um, but then there's lots of other things, the portfolio management, the fact that we have security products that aren't effective, that haven't been, that haven't been configured correctly. Um, those are all things that we need to focus on. Once you get rid of those things, then there's things above that. Have we architected our network correctly or do we have holes there? Um, it's, there's lots of layers to this problem, but I think as a whole, the, the topic here has been about how to produce an end-to-end -end, um, visibility of uh, process that crosses those layers. That's fine. I, you know, I just didn't know we had to go anywhere. I'll go. Yeah. It's fine. Okay, I'll go. There. We've, we've had some fun. Um, I, so I, I think if you look historically, like, there are attacks that we detect now that we call commodity attacks that weren't commodity, you know, six, seven, eight years ago. And that's because we've, we've been able to, to your point, like, um, you know, develop technology, make them low-hanging fruit, make them easy to detect. Um, and, and we're seeing a lot fewer um, uh, attacks against broad-scale systems. Like, we're, we're not having worms in 2019, not to jinx it, but, um, you know, most organizations have got their stuff figured out, the software vendors got their stuff figured out, and we're seeing attackers go after the humans, and we're seeing attackers go after businesses specifically with weaknesses in what they've implemented. Um, and so when I think about automation, I think, like, it's easy to codify and it's easy to automate commodity attacks because they're absolute bad, right? Like, buffer overflow, bad. There's basically no situation in which it's okay. I mean, there's all kinds of things you say are absolute bad. Then there's a lot of behavioral things and other stuff that you want to codify and you want to automate, but it's hard because it changes and it's business specific and economically it's very expensive to implement from an MSSP perspective or even internal to an organization. So I think we're going to see attackers make hay at targeted attacks against businesses, against specific business logic with less and less and less reliance on uh, uh, operating system and application weaknesses that affect thousands of organizations. Right. So I do have one backup question, but I'll let you answer your question. And then I want to talk a little bit about how as we move from, you know, um, on-prem centric, you know, um, topologies to hybrid and cloud topologies mm -hmm. on how that changes the score game. But uh, yeah, so um, given that we're talking about the evolution, I'll, I'll ask for your predictions with respect to SOAR technology. For example, is SOAR technology going to be sort of absorbed into the existing security product market space such that we don't even really even see it anymore? Or do you see it, um, you know, how do you see SOAR technology evolving into the broader landscape? Yeah, Adam? I, I love that question because there's an architectural component too, and I'm a former architect. So um, when you think about the, the tenants of SOAR, the workflow, orchestration, um, the usage of data to inform decision making, like I, I hope that SOAR concepts are part of every product. Um, but there's also going to be a role for um, maybe SOAR proper that crosses a products, but it, it will get confusing before it gets any clearer where the products that use SOAR tenants start and stop and where you should architect a messaging and, um, and capability across those products within your organization. Yeah, and I personally think that there's always going to be room for an agnostic SOAR vendor that is not, you know, just, you know, kind of just selling the dog food of, you know, a very large security vendor. Um, there's always going to be room for that agnosticity in the market. Um, all right, so I want to uh, ask, ask the panel one more question. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. Thank you for recognizing me. Um, the question I have, for us, of, us that are old enough to remember the copy protection wars, which was about 20 years ago, probably, maybe more, where the software people in, would come up with a copy protection 
implement it, then it would be cracked. They come up with fixes for it. Yeah. It'd be cracked. They come up with a new one. It'd be cracked. Finally, it came to the point where they gave up because they couldn't get ahead of the attackers. Now, is this where machine language and SOC and SOAR and all this is going to end up, that we're never going to get ahead of the <laughs> attackers? I'll take it. Oh. Okay. So uh, this is where I want to, to redefine how people think. Right now, SOAR is thought of as getting, dealing with a noodle loop. And I, I think about CrowdStrike and their, what, one, five, 1060 or 11060 number that says it should take you one minute to detect, 10 minutes to um, do something, and 60 minutes to to remediate or take a response, which is more of a block kind of thing, not a real remediation or recovery as you you put out. Well, there's two numbers missing from that. The first one is I think there should be a 20 in front of it, which is you should only be dealing with 20% of the stuff that's hitting you. Right? You need to be do the proactive and the, the stuff that stops them from even coming. You can't do that number on everything being thrown at you. And I think there should be a number at the end, which is sort of the real recovery mitigation response piece. And then there's a process improvement that's getting you proactively blocking sets. So may, I don't know where machine learning and AI are going to fit into anything, but I will tell you, if we don't get to speed and scale, where well, we start dealing with detecting and responding on less and less and less, and figuring out how to take the lessons learned to TTPs and figuring out proactive, proactive defenses and actual protections, we don't get ahead. It is speed and scale, and scale is the number, the thing that is forgotten by almost everybody in this business. We're just trying to do things faster, so SOAR, better start to deal with helping manage scale. Like how do we consume, like a, a playbook doesn't end at its last step. There's a whole other set of steps that need to be there, which is how do we take this information and like not have this alert happen again, yeah. right? Yeah. So, or how do we say we've closed 99 firewall or alerts in the past week? They're all false positives. Fix your freaking sim, right? So I, I think that there's a silver lining in that. If you look at modern IT systems, be it endpoint, laptop, phone, whatever, or the services that run everything, the one common thread is they have become more manageable over the last stretch, right? Like, I can lay hands on quicker, I can make things better, uh, happen better. Um, if you look at the evolution in the server environment from bare metal servers to virtualized to container to serverless, like, I can take action at scale in, in, in a time uh, frame that three years ago was almost unheard of, right? Um, and the same in, in most enterprise environments when it comes to the desktop. And so, um, you know, I think the SOAR technologies are going to be able to ride on the back of that, those management platforms to be able to do that next step to say, like, I remediated this box, but what does that mean to all my other containers? Well, now I'll just go do the thing to all the other containers, too, where there was no way you would ever have that step available to you before. So I don't know that we're quite there yet, but I see that as the next step is, yeah, the scale yeah. is because we already have the scale in front of us. Let's just leverage it. But, but I feel it's not just about going and doing all those containers, too. It's also about going and putting that protection in place so that we can never get to that state again, yeah. at least in, in that, you know, atomic attack, right? And the, but the problem is, is like, we're going to be pl playing whack-a-mole like that forever. Um, all right, so uh, the, the last question for the panel I want to throw out there is, um, it, it's not, not like SOAR started after the cloud, or before the cloud era in general, but as, as we get more complex networks, we need to start reaching out to more places uh, to do automation. So like, if I, if I think of like, you know, today's, uh, yesterday and today's deployments, you know, they're very hybrid, but you know, we're, you know, I'm starting to see services that are just Lambda and Dyn DynamoDB, right? And that's it, right? Now, how, as, for, as a SOAR vendor, and from, a, from a, an opportunistic view of being able to protect and defend those systems with SOAR, um, how, are we, how do you guys see SOAR addressing those? But the kind of the other side of this is like, as we get to more configuration as code, more people post like all the stuff to GitHub, and like you know, there, there's there's not there's actually more um, surface area of attack or of ability for people to do recon, like you know, developers putting keys on GitHub, whatever it might be. So so I'm kind of you know I'm gonna ask you a really open ended question to just kind of see like where do you think SOAR can help. Um, organizations who are trying to manage big cloud infrastructures, they have serious DevOps things going on. So it sounds like you're saying that the enterprise has become more complicated 
Their <laughs> technology is more complicated. Their, um, well, their development like the is DevOps more complicated. Well, it's like the DevOps person like the new sysadmin in a way, right? Yeah. Um, For sure. So, and it's, that's like a different skill set than like the guy who runs Active Directory. And a different set of things to protect. I, I would uh, make the analogy that the the enterprise is kind of like a, a, a conveyor belt, and over the last five to ten years, that conveyor belt has been um, put on steroids. It's going so much faster. Cloud computing, uh, different development methodologies, the DevOps world. CI. Uh, yeah. um, these are all uh, techniques that the business is using to go so much faster on the technology side, and security just doesn't have um, the, the capacity or the, the automation and the technology to keep up with that. So um, I will say that uh, when the DevOps push kind of first happened, I was terrified, because I'm like, developers are idiots, and um, they'll make horrible decisions with their infrastructure and make all kinds of bad things happen. Um, and I was waiting for like the catastrophic failure of every DevOps tool chain where developers just screwed it up at every turn and their enterprises were just falling apart at the seams. And it turns out that hasn't happened, and I'm a little embarrassed that I predicted that. Um, but uh, what I think is, has occurred um, is there are some situations where it's just been catastrophic failures for DevOps environments where they've like put their public, you know, their, their private keys into public GitHub repositories and like, yeah, bad things will happen when you do that. That's, I'm sorry, there's really no way around it. But it turns out most developers want to write good code, and if infrastructure is code, that means they want to make good infrastructure too. And I see a lot of developers making way better decisions about infrastructure than I would have thought they were going to make in the first place. Uh, and which, that's good. Which is right? good, I'm not complaining. Well, and, and so I'm gonna say, well, how do we, as SecOps people, start to consume that type of thinking and apply that to this problem? Well, you need signal, right? I mean, all this stuff, all the source stuff, be, be, uh, exist if you have signal, right? And so you work with your your developers to provide the signal from the infrastructure, which is the code, so that you can consume it and make better automated security decisions. And yes. they're already doing that, right? If you look at the DevOps universe and you look at CI, there's so much instrumentation going on right now with how these systems are working. And if I need to make it elastic, like I have to understand all those, those levers and make it work on its own. So security of them is actually a lot shorter gap to bridge than it was, I'd say, 10 years ago for that reason. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I, I, I'm, I'm starting to see this happen, but you know, security vendors are starting to eat that dog food, where they're starting to provide the bells and whistles or the flat, you know, the feature flags in their products to basically, you know, spin up another service to scale based on, you know, an environment variable and, and doing things like that. So I, I think, I, I agree that we're going in the right direction. Um, yeah, I wish I had Josh Corman here to kind of like yeah, talk about Josh that. Yeah, right Josh would be calling me out right now because he and I, yeah, it was bad. Yeah. <laughs> so we are done. Awesome. Twelve fifteen. Right. Is there any one last comment you want to make? Um, or? Well, I, I throw it at the panel, right? This is your panel. I'm just the guy asking the question. I guess the one last thing I want to say is the first thing that has to change in SOAR is a lot of the architectures because we're going to get more effects-based versus action-based because you are going to be getting signal from getting telemetry from, making decisions on, and taking actions on things you do not own and manage. And you're gonna have to speak to the, the characterization of the thing that's happening to you and the effect you wanna have without saying the actions you want to take because you don't know. And I'll leave it at that. All right, thanks everybody. <laughs>